Before we begin to address systems engineering, that is, the engineering of a system, we need to have a brief look at what we mean when we say that something is a system. Now this is particularly important because the word system is perhaps one of the most overused words in the English language. And that's because the word system has many contexts. There are physical systems such as solar systems, river systems, railway systems, satellite systems, communication systems, information systems, pulley systems, nervous systems, just to name a few. There are philosophical systems, social systems, religious systems, gambling systems, banking systems, systems of government, and many, many more. The word is even used for more esoteric examples, such as the consideration of individual and social behaviour as a system of purposeful events. Now in all these contexts, the common aspect of the use of the word system comes from its early meaning and its Greek root. A system refers to the whole, or the set, that results when a number of things have been grouped together, in a particular manner and for a particular reason. What the set is, how it's grouped, and for what reason, is context dependent however. So before we continue, we should briefly consider what we mean by a system in the particular context of systems engineering. In systems engineering, a system can be defined as a set of elements that interact to achieve a stated purpose. This definition implies that a system comprises system elements with interconnections or interactions between those elements and by the very act of identifying the system that we're interested in, an external system boundary is also implied. When we draw the boundary around selected system elements, we define the system of interest. That system of interest comprises those system elements and their interconnections that exist within our defined system boundary. The purpose of the system is called its mission, which must be clearly stated by business management and stakeholders. The mission represents the start point for the design process, as well as providing the basis for the ultimate test of the system's fitness for purpose once it's been fielded. In the broadest sense, then, the mission of the system is to provide a solution to a business problem. This narrowing of the general use of the word system is very important because it has two major implications. First, when we refer to a system as comprising system elements that are interconnected in order to achieve a purpose, we imply that all three of those principal aspects result from conscious choice. That is, we're referring to a system that has been deliberately designed or engineered, hence our interest in systems engineering. A system that has been engineered to perform a specified mission, must be able to perform that mission with relative autonomy. That is, it must be managerially and operationally independent, and it may well have even been procured independently. We return to this issue shortly when we discuss the difference between systems and subsystems, and between systems and systems of systems. There are numerous ways to classify systems. Here we identify the four main types in order to be clear as to which type of system we refer to in systems engineering and therefore in the remainder of this course. There are closed or open systems. There are natural, human-made or human-modified systems. There are physical or conceptual systems. There are precedented or unprecedented systems. Let's look at each of those a little more closely. An open system interacts with its operating environment. That is, it's open. It accepts inputs from that environment across its boundary and returns outputs across the same boundary back into its external environment. A closed system, on the other hand, is isolated from its external environment. We are only interested in useful systems, which must therefore be open. Natural systems contain natural elements and are the result of natural processes. Human-made systems come into existence through the efforts of humans and may contain some human-made elements or perhaps some natural elements adapted to human-designed purposes. Natural systems that have been modified for human purposes are called human-modified systems. The systems engineering for natural systems has certainly not been conducted by humans, so we are only interested in human-made or human-modified systems. Physical systems exist in a physical form. Conceptual systems do not. They're conceptual. Since our focus in systems engineering is on engineering a system, things we can actually produce, we're interested in physical systems. In a precedented system, similar such systems, or at least the majority of system elements, have been produced before. 
An unprecedented system is one that's not been previously produced. Systems that comprise mostly unprecedented elements are the result of research and development. Here we're focusing on systems that comprise largely precedented elements, that is, those that we have engineered before, and therefore those to which system engineering is most appropriate. Now based on those four classes of system, there are a wide variety of combinations that can lead to a large number of types of systems, each of which has markedly different properties. But it's important to recognise that in this course, and in systems engineering, we're talking about open, physical systems that are human-made or modified from largely precedented elements. Now returning to our simple diagram of a system, since we're interested in engineering physical systems that are open, our system of interest must accommodate external interfaces, that is, inputs and outputs, across the system boundary, connected then to external elements that exist in an external operating environment or perhaps a related system. To extend even further, sometimes we need to be aware of an even wider context. So an SOI might be considered as part of a wider SOI, a WSOI, which exists within an operating environment. And that operating environment could be conceived to even be part of a wider environment. In a physical sense, the term system is sometimes considered to be synonymous with product. That is, we say that the project is delivering a system or it's delivering a product. A system, however, is normally considered to comprise a number of products. NCIA 632 sees a system as comprising operational products, or end products, and enabling products, such as test, training, and disposal products. Before we go any further, however, we must acknowledge that the systems we are interested in are much more than an aggregation of hardware or software products, and must also be described in terms of all of the constituent elements, including the major hardware and software of course, but also the organisations within which the system will be fielded, the personnel who will interact with it in many ways, the collective training systems required, as well as the facilities, the data, the support, including even supplies, required to keep the system in service as well as the operating procedures and organisational policies. The system is fully defined by the combination of these resources operating in its operating environment in order to achieve its purpose, its mission. In that sense then, we can define a system as delivering an operational capability. It's common therefore, particularly in defence environments, to refer to the system at this level as a capability system. In the US Department of Defence, the acronym DOT-MLPF refers to the capability system elements of doctrine, organisation, training, materiel, leadership, personnel and facilities. In Australia, the capability system is considered to comprise fundamental inputs to capability, or FIC, command and management, organisation, collective training, major systems, personnel, facilities, supply and support. In the United Kingdom, the defence lines of development refer to doctrine and concepts, organisation, training, equipment, personnel, infrastructure, logistics and information. In Canada, the acronym PRICEY refers to personnel, research and development, infrastructure, concepts and doctrine, information technology and equipment. And all of these acronyms refer to a system as a capability system. Now having acknowledged therefore that a capability system has a number of elements, it must also be recognised that each of those elements will probably have a different acquisition cycle. For example, people will be acquired in a different manner to that in which the major system was developed. And each element of the capability may even be acquired by a different acquisition element of the organisation. Consequently, joining all these subsystems together into a system is actually a complicated effort. In the remainder of this course, for ease of description, we focus on the acquisition of just the major equipment element often called the material system, to make it easier to understand the linear sequential process. We must always keep in mind, however, that this acquisition is being undertaken in parallel with the acquisitions of the other elements of capability, and that all of those elements must then be brought back together prior to introduction into service in order to field the full operational capability. So, for example, in an aircraft system, the resources for that capability system are many, they will include, but not necessarily be limited to, the people we need, so the personnel, we need air crew to operate the system, and ground crew to maintain and support the fleet. We need support, we need maintenance facilities and equipment for routine maintenance and repairs, 
Materials are required to operate the system, including the fuel, of course, and lubricants and other consumables such as tyres and spare parts. We need facilities for support and for operations. We need terminals and, and support facilities to maintain the aircraft. We need organisations and policies and procedures. ACME, the company that runs the aircraft, will need to conform to a significant number of regulations and will need appropriate organisational structures, policies and procedures to operate the aircraft effectively. We'll need collective training systems. The aircrew and the ground crew will require training throughout the system life cycle. We'll need data. Data is required to maintain and operate the aircraft and also to include maintenance information such as specifications and drawings and operational information such as user manuals and instructions. But then finally, of course last but not least, we need the major equipment. We need the aircraft. The aircraft will need to be produced and then deployed to those operators who will use the aircraft in a number of different ways and of course one of those users will be ACME. Of course there is much more to major equipment than hardware. Software is also now a critical item within many systems. The aircraft will use hardware and software to control a range of functions from engine management through navigation and environmental control, communications and flight control systems.